Okay. All right, we're going to get going. Um, my hope today is to finish a few minutes early and have time for questions like we did last week. Um, but if we don't, uh, I'll try to open up next week with some more questions. Uh, the good news, good news is recordings have gone up quickly so far. So last week's recording was up within, um, I think, 12 hours. Uh, we had it up in, on YouTube. And so hopefully that'll be the standard that we go by from now on. So we're in talk two today, which is theology in the nature of God. Last week, we talked about the yearning of man and how only Christ can fill the deepest, inescapable longings that mankind has. These are longings that we, we cannot have, we, we cannot do without. We can't live without these longings. And we spoke about Christ as the one who brings purpose and meaning to man and a purpose and meaning that contains four elements. And if you remember, we d discussed how those four elements are, are necessary for meaning and purpose to be absolutely uh, true and fulfilling in our lives. In order for meaning and purpose to fill us perfectly, that meaning and purpose has to be true, it has to be unchanging, it has to transcend death, and it must be based in love. That was the main point that we talked about last week. We also talked about um, the motivations that man has for God, how man can serve as either a slave of God in which case his motivations for living the faith are simply fear of punishment. Man can serve as a hired servant of God, in which case he's just ex expecting reward. Or man can serve as a child of God. Uh, that's one who, who wants to serve God and fulfill his commandments simply out of love for him. The ideal is that third one, but really all three of them we use throughout our entire spiritual life and our relationship with Christ. You may be deeply tempted one day and find that that temptation is very much overcoming and overshadowing your love for Christ. You may find that the expectation of reward isn't really motivating you. What may motivate you is the possibility of punishment, the possibility of torment. And so that may keep you from sinning. So all three of these were used by Christ and are useful to us. But ideally, we want the foundational one to be love for Christ. That develops in time. That takes a lot of time. So... All of these, these uh, discussions served as a theoretical basis for the rest of our catechism. And the rest of our catechism is really about the question, how does Christ bring us meaning and purpose in life in such a way that we, we love him and yearn for him? And to answer this, we have to know who God is, who man is, why man is so broken, how his healing occurs, and what that healing looks like once accomplished. This is really the entirety of, of our catechism uh, class. So today's topic is going to be theology and the nature of God. Now, a little warning before we get into today. Last week, I told you it was going to be pretty simple. You know, we didn't cover too much. I told you there was going to be more meat in the coming weeks. Today's is a little bit tough. It's, uh, it can be uh, full of some difficult ideas. Not every catechism will be this tough, uh, but uh, this is a necessary one when we talk about the nature of God. It's going to be a little bit necessary that we go through some difficult theology. And so if at any point you feel like I'm going too fast or it's too much for you, just raise your hand, ask me to repeat something, no problem, okay? So before we speak directly about God and God's nature, we have to talk about how to talk about God and how not to talk about God. And so before we begin today's lecture, we should really sign ourselves with a very strong and deliberate cross as we begin to speak about the holiest topic one could discuss. In talking about God, we realize that theology should not be taken lightly. There's one uh, uh, modern figure, Father Seraphim Rose, who, who may be glorified uh, relatively soon as a saint, uh, and he, he warns against doing theology with a wine glass. And this is, this is something that we have to understand. We can't do theology casually, because theology can be dangerous. Because when we talk about God, we implant ideas about God. And as we'll talk about today, ideas about God change the way we relate to God. So we need to make sure we have those proper ideas. And in talking about the holiest one in existence, we need to make sure that we do so seriously. And we need to do so not casually, but rather with a great deal of humility and a great deal of awe. And this is one of the, the, the um, aspects about Orthodox worship that attracts so many people. They see that we always worship with a sense of awe before God. This awe has really been lost in a lot of worship today. Orthodoxy maintains that sense of awe before God, which really places us in our proper place as a creation of God, in a humble position. And yet God wants to honor us. 
He wants to glorify us, which for us should result in a great deal of gratitude. But that means that as we, as we strive for that union with God, as we strive to be exalted by God, we need to humble ourselves. And we do that especially when we talk about God. So what is theology? Theology is exactly that. It's talking about God. Theology comes from the word theos, which means God, and logos, or logi, which means words. So words about God literally is translated as, or li literally is, is written as, theology. Okay? So why is theology important? Why is it important that we talk about God and that we try to get the right ideas about God? I'd suggest three main reasons for this. Number one, we want to know what is true about God. We want to know what's true about God, what's false about God. Number two, we want to be able to convey to others what is true and what isn't. So that's, that's different from the first. Knowing what's true about God is important, and conveying what's true about God is another thing. We may know what's true about God, but not be able to express it. Theology helps it, us express it to other people. And third, perhaps most importantly, theology relates directly to something we call proxies. Proxies is simply defined as the action of faith, how we live out our faith. So the first principle I want you to understand today is how much beliefs affect practice and how much our practices affect our belief. And so there are three, I think there's three main principles that I have highlighted in this that I, I tell people it'd be good to memorize these statements because they'll really help you understand the whole outline of what we're talking about today. So the first big principle, our worship informs our theology and our theology informs our worship. Okay, Our worship informs our theology and our theology informs our worship. So this means that worship and theology are balanced. They're balanced like on a teeter-totter. If you change one side, the other side naturally has to balance out. If you change what you believe about God, how you relate to God, and therefore how you worship, and worship is not just what we do in the church, it's how we live as Christians. That will change. It has to change to balance it out. And it works the other way, which we'll talk about in a second, that if we change the way we live in relation to God, what we believe about God will also change. So our worship informs our theology, and our theology informs our worship. We mentioned last week that Jesus didn't leave us a set of instructions. So what did he leave us? He left us a way of living. He left the, the, uh, the apostles with instructions, not only on what to believe, but how to live. And this is their main concern. This is why in Christianity, early on, they weren't called Christians. It wasn't called a Christian path. It was called the way. That's the literal uh, definition of what the Christian uh, way of life was called. So in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, in Acts 9-2, we read, Now Saul requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any men or women who belonged to the way, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. This is literally what Christianity is called at the time, the way. And it's called the way multiple times in Acts. So besides Acts 9-2, we can include Acts 19-9, Acts 19.23, Acts 22.4, 24.14, and 24.22. In every single one of these places, the Christian life is simply defined as the way. This is what Christ primarily left us. Now, remember, all of our talks go back to the, the topic of a relationship with Christ. This is why talking about Christianity as the way is so significant. Because what, what exactly are we talking about when we say the way? The way to what? It's the way to Christ. The way to Christ and our proper relationship with him. So why are beliefs so important in following the proper way? Well, what we believe affects how we live. And when we believe different things, our direction is changed. So think about just if you're going on a journey, okay? If you're going on a journey, if we change a belief about what the proper way to get to that destination is, and we veer, even to the smallest degree, from the proper and true path, the destination is naturally altered as well. So if I tell you walk in a straight line, and I give you the exact direction, but you have a broken compass, and that compass is off by just a degree or two, the first few steps, you're not that far off from your destination. But the further you go, you can end up massively far from your intended destination. And this is the same with theology. 
what we believe about God, if we get one thing just a little bit off, sometimes that can have immense consequences later down the line. This is one of the things, we won't get into this today, but this is what happened in the West with the Filioque. The Filioque states that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And now, in Orthodoxy, we say the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and through the Son. We'll talk about that today. Now, initially, did this have a massive effect on, on the way the West worshipped? No. But over time, it began to have more and more effects, and there began to become a greater and greater chasm between the East and the West. St. Gregory Palamas talks about this in his Apodictic Treatise on the Holy Spirit, um, which I think is going to be published any day now. Um, I have a good friend who actually translated it, so I've had a copy of it for a while. I never finished it. I need to go back and finish it. But either way, he talks about how this one little doctrinal change, which may seem very small, actually ends up having massive effects upon the faith. So, as I said, our destination is union with God in Christ. It's what we call theosis. Sometimes it's translated as deification. And sometimes it's translated, in my preferred term, I like the term glorification. Okay? By the way, a little note about this in theology. I said we shouldn't do uh, theology casually. I, I know holy elders who said even the casual way in which we say the word theosis is dangerous. We're way too casual with the meaning of this term, what this actually means for us in the process. And we talk about it as if we're just sitting in a bar talking casually about a sports team. We should be extremely cautious about how we talk about This is a grand thing, which when we actually witness it, you fall completely dumb. You, I mean, you, you lose any sense of self. I was reading just recently the life of uh, St. Joseph of Optina, and one priest talks about his experience where he went to go meet him, he didn't really think much about, uh, about these, these supposedly great elders. And he went and sat down with, uh, with Elder Joseph. And when he began talking, he said he saw this, this, his face begin to shine and this light radiate for you know, like, like six or seven inches from his head. And he said the sight was so glorious, he was completely overcome, that he forgot all of his questions. He forgot why he was there. He couldn't speak. He was just stunned with what he was seeing. And finally, he kind of shook himself back into realization. And he said, he tried to remember for a minute why he was there. And he asked his question. And he said, for a moment, the light went away. And then suddenly, boom, it started shining again. And he, he said he couldn't remember a word. He couldn't remember a single word that he was told. Because the vision of this was so great. This is theosis. This is why we're so cautious with this term. Because when, we're, when we actually know what we're talking about, we don't, we're, we're afraid to talk about it. We're very cautious when we use words about God because of how grand and how magnificent this is. So, as I said, going back to this, theology affects our worship. When we change what we believe about God, how we relate to God changes. And that may mean that in some cases, especially when we really veer off, it can be a danger to our relationship with God. And you see this in practical examples around yourself. In fact, in fact you may have lived this in your life. Maybe you think of God primarily as this angry deity looking down on you. Okay, is this really what God is? No, a God who joyfully throws people into hell. Well, if you believe that about God, how you relate to God is going to change. And your personality is probably going to change. You're going to become uh, much more anxious, much more nervous in how you live. You're going to be uh, scared every time you fall away from the perfect path. You're going to constantly seek perfection. This will change how you are. It'll change how you relate to your spouse. It'll change how you relate to your children and how you raise them. Everything changes all because of this false view about God. And so we need to be cautious that our view about God is proper, which means it must be revealed. It has to be a revealed image of God, revealed in the scriptures to the apostles and to the saints for 2,000 years in the church. So theology affects our worship, our entire way of living as Christians, um, and this in, it can injure our relationship with Christ. But the opposite is also true. How we worship affects our theology. So if, if I came in one day and said, you know what, we're not going to do the divine liturgy. I wrote my own service. I decided, well, I'm going to write that service based on what I already think about God. And if I have some false ideas, I'm going to change the way we worship. You're going to change the way you, if you even stay in the door. If I do that, run, by the way. If I ever do that and just say, I created the service however I wanted it, you know I'm not the right guy. Run away. But if you stick around, well, that worship is going to relate to what I already believe about God. And the way you worship will change how you relate to God. So one of the places we see this is in the prayers of the church. A lot of people take the prayer books and they're kind of shocked by the language in the prayer book. They say, this isn't how I talk to God. 
And the advice I give is, do them anyway. Do them anyway. Because what will happen is, is those, those prayers were written by people who were filled with the grace of God and were transformed by God and the Holy Spirit prayed through them. This is the language of God. It tells us how God wants us to relate to him. And so the more you pray those prayers, the more your heart is reformed. And what will happen is, a lot of people say at the beginning, those prayers are hard to read because they feel like they're just beaten down on themselves. It just doesn't feel natural. But the more they pray them, the more they fall in love and they go, now this is expressing the true language of my heart. This is my real disposition towards God now. It's changed. And so now these prayers actually, instead of making you feel beaten down, they actually make me feel filled with a lot of grace. I feel like I'm relating properly to God. I see God with more awe. I see him with more love. And I yearn for prayer more. These prayers will actually change us. So, second big principle of the day. Remember the first one? Our theology affects our worship, and our worship affects our theology. Those things need to be balanced. Second principle, the, the most true and purest theology is first experienced and then spoken. The truest theology is experienced first and then spoken. Okay? You remember last week we talked about the, the mystery of God? Imagine that mystery of God floated in front of us and that so many people sit there and they try to describe that mystery as best they can. They use logic. They use whatever study they can do. They use whatever intellectual methods they can. But the orthodox method of doing this really is to say, no, 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 I'm not going to try to describe what I see because no, no human words will suffice. I'm just going to step right in the middle of the mystery and experience God. And then, then if forced to, I'll try my best to use words to explain what it is I'm experiencing. This is what the truest theology is. Evagrius of Ponticus wrote this very famous line, a theologian is one who prays, and one who prays truly is a theologian. This is why you can get an uneducated monk or nun, or even just a lay Christian, who really prays and becomes very holy, and suddenly they know more about God than the greatest scholars out there. Out of the apostles, besides St. Paul, not many of them were very well educated. How were they taught? Through the experience of Pentecost. It was the experience of Pentecost that taught them so that the entire world now looks to them and has for 2,000 years for answers about who God is. It's the experience that taught them first. This is the highest form of theology. And it's one in which words eventually completely fall away because you realize that no word will suffice. This happened to St. Seraphim and Sarav. We have on the, one of the uh, uh, stands back there, we have an icon of St. Seraphim. It's one of the most beloved uh, saints of the church. He took one of his disciples, whose name was Motovilov, out into the wilderness, began having a conversation with him. And as he was talking, just like St. Joseph of Optina, St. Seraphim began to shine with his brilliant light. And Batovilov is looking at him. You can read this account. He says, I can barely look at you. I, can't, I can barely make out the, the details of your face because this light is so bright. And in this conversation, St. Seraphim of Sarov is describing the purpose of the spiritual life. He says, the purpose of the Christian life is simple, to acquire the grace of the Holy Spirit. The increase of the grace of the Holy Spirit is the whole purpose. And he says, you get to a point sometimes in prayer where the experience is so powerful Words are no longer necessary and you just fall silent. And I read that and I went, how can that be that you stop praying? But you're praying for the experience. Once you're in the experience, in the state of what we might call ecstasy, well then suddenly the words are no longer sufficient. You're just communing directly with God. This is why a lot of the fathers say in heaven we're going to use the language of the angels, which means it's a, it's a language of silence. doesn't mean we can't communicate with one another, but words won't be sufficient. We'll be able to communicate in a deeper, more personal level. So, what, is, what makes this possible? Well, we see in the Beatitudes, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So, receptiveness of the experience of grace is reliant upon the purity of our hearts. This is really what we look towards. Now, does this mean that somebody who is an academic theologian shouldn't be called a theologian if they, they're not experiencing these same things? No, no. We call them a theologian, but we understand that this is not the same thing as a monk who may only have a third grade education and yet has experienced God directly. This is why like great theologians would go to St. Paisius, St. Paisius of Mount Athos, who died in 1994. He, he wasn't well educated, but great theologians would go and ask him questions because they recognized his experience is exactly what they're trying to write about. But the ones who are writing to him, we can still call theologians just with the understanding that we mean it in a more academic sense. And then there are those 
who are on the way towards this experience and may have had it, but still recognize that there are those who are spiritually even beyond them. And this happened with St. Athanasius. St. Athanasius the Great, he's a, a phenomenal theologian. The first ecumenical synod, where they uh, fought against Arianism and, and taught that Christ is fully God, this was largely based on St. Athanasius' theology. He at the time was just a deacon. He wasn't even a bishop yet. He eventually became Patriarch of Alexandria. However, despite the fact that St. Athanasius was recognized for being one of the most brilliant minds in the entire world at that time, he would go off into the deep desert often to go to his spiritual teacher, who we have evidence didn't even know how to read, St. Anthony the Great. St. Athanasius eventually wrote The Life of St. Anthony. Well worth your time reading, by the way. Every Orthodox should read this at one time or another. It's in English in a couple different translations. St. Athanasius, this well-educated, brilliant mind, would go to St. Anthony. Even though St. Athanasius was holding his own right, he recognized that St. Anthony had surpassed all. And so he would go to him, and he would check his theology with him, and he would ask him, how do I fight against the Arians? What's the right tactic to take? What are the better arguments to use? This is very instructive for us, that this simple, unlettered monk would become the teacher of this brilliant theologian. And this is because experience teaches first. So, in early Christianity, many heresies never really found strong footing because they were automatically and immediately recognized as heresy. Why? Not because the church was full of great theologians, but because that heresy did not coincide with the way the church was already worshiping. It often directly contradicted that worship. And so the Christians were able to say, this isn't the Christ we've always worshipped. This doesn't match with what we've always done. And so we know that even if we can't explain why, we know this is wrong. And so a lot of these heresies didn't last past the person who created them. Their founder would die and the heresy would die out with them. This didn't always happen, obviously, but it happened many times. The worship became the standard because just as true theology is experienced first and is a revelation, so true worship is a revelation. We believe the worship of the church was given to the saints. It's not like you know Christ came down with a notebook and says, take some notes. This is how I want this is what, you, what I want you to say when. But rather it was people who had this experience in prayer who wrote the words of these these uh, these services and made the order and said, This is the expression of what I experienced directly with God. Um, as an example of this, by the way, St. Simeon the New Theologian is one of the first saints who describes in detail his experience of the grace of God. He talks about how he's in a small cell and it begins to fill with light. And he said he, 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 he couldn't even see the walls or anymore. And he looked down, he couldn't see the floor. He, and he said for a split second, he thought he was falling because he, there was no floor. All there was was light. And he, he describes in one place that this light, although one, was also three. Somehow it was both three and one at the same time. That's the nature of the Trinity. So this is directly revealed to him in this state of prayer. And he's able to express it then in words. Okay? So, as I said, if we change the way we worship, our theology will have to be molded to fit it. And as an example of this, I read uh, maybe five years ago, I read a Protestant book on prayer. And it's from an author, I actually, this uh, Protestant pastor and author I really respect. A lot of what, what he's written I really, really enjoyed. And so he came out with this book on prayer, and I got kind of interested in it. I said, okay, well, let's, let's see if this is any good. It was terrible. It was, it was, the whole thing was awful. And it was awful because I, I've, I've read so many saints and how they prayed, and everything he was saying was against that. So he criticized and rejected or, the orthodoxy in the Jesus prayer and anything he saw as mystical prayer. And he wrote why mystical prayer is problematic and wrong. And I just I looked at this, and I don't despise him for it, but I said, this is sad because it shows me his experience of worship doesn't make room for proper theology on prayer. In other words, it's his inexperience in deep prayer that caused him to write this. Our theology informs our worship, and our worship informs our theology. Based on how he was worshiping, he thinks the Jesus prayer is wrong, problematic, useless, maybe even dangerous. It's too bad he hasn't, he hasn't uh, worshipped in Orthodox churches where he realizes just how powerful a prayer this actually is. So, we now come to the third principle for the day. The third principle is theology 
is stating in human and finite words something that is divine and infinite. Okay, Theology is stating in human and finite words something that is divine and infinite. Now, can a human created finite word properly describe the divine and uncreated reality of God? No. <laughs> no, it, it can't. This means that theology is impossible. True theology is impossible. We cannot properly talk about God. Now, we still have to do it, which we'll talk about in a minute. We'll talk about how we kind of get around that or are cautious with, excuse me, cautious with it. But this is a scriptural precept. Where, where do you find this in the scriptures? Anybody know? St. Paul. St. Paul in his humility talks about this as if it's a different person, but everyone recognizes that this was him he's talking about. And in Corinth, to the Corinthians, he writes that he was caught up into the third heaven, into paradise. And what happened? And quote, he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Another translation says it would be unlawful for man to utter. Why may he not utter them? Why may he not speak them? Because words are so inadequate that they, by necessity, degrade, tarnish, or sully the true experience in some way or another. If he were to describe his experience, he says it's unlawful because just in doing so, the words will never, it doesn't matter what words he uses, how grand, how poetic, they will never suffice. And so they will somehow tarnish the experience itself. And for that, he would be held to account. So he says, in this case, the, the words may not be uttered. It's much, much like in, in an analogous way, and, and don't take this analogy too far. We use a lot of analogies in theology because they're helpful for trying to describe things that you can't describe, so don't take this too far. But it's, it's much like if I were trying to describe a flavor to someone who had never tasted that flavor before. So imagine if someone, someone has never eaten an orange before, never had anything that's, that's flavored like an orange, never had any, any sort of citrus, and I try to describe what an orange tastes like. Are they going to have any idea? Barely. Barely. You know, maybe if, if like the whole of the experience of tasting an orange was like this, maybe they'd have this much. Maybe a little speck. And that's it. Which means it would be much better if I just said, you know what, I have another orange here, why don't you just try it? Why don't you just eat it, and then you can see what it's like? Well, it's the same thing with, with the experience of God. It can't truly be explained. It has to be experienced. And so, in trying to describe the nature of one who is uncreated, this is God, created words will never suffice. But, having said this, we still try to take that experience and put it into imperfect words as best we can. When we need to. So why do we need to do this? There are three main reasons for this. Number one, we have to put theology into word because it sets up boundaries. It sets up boundaries that protect us from false beliefs. So if I notice you believing something wrong about God that I said could lead to imperfect and maybe even dangerous worship and ruin your relationship with God, I have to use words to say, no, 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 you have it wrong here. This isn't true. This is true. In other words, we want to watch out and set up a boundary so you don't believe this because this is actually a dangerous belief. For instance, well, again, we talked about Arianism, the idea that there was a time when the Son of God did not exist, that he, he's, he may be the greatest of all creation, but he's still a creation. That could be a dangerous belief. In fact, it is a dangerous belief. And you know what else it'll do? It'll make that theosis that we talked about, that union with God, impossible. Because if... Jesus Christ wasn't fully God, then no union between man and God ever happened in his person, which means it can't happen with us. Well, now the whole point of the faith is gone. This is why theology is so important. So it sets up boundaries. Number two, with proper theology, with good theology, you can draw people towards the beauty and glory of that true experience. In other words, it helps people grow in zeal. So a saint may write something where he says, you know, I can't really describe this experience, but as best I can describe it, this is what it was like, like St. Simeon, the new theologian. And in doing so, other Christians will read this and say, I want that. I really want that. And so now my zeal is increasing. I'm, I'm going to look to St. Simeon and say, how did you get that experience? I want to follow the same path. I can tell that this, this, this path that seeks purity of heart, that seeks the glory of God fully in your life, I want the same thing. You achieved it, so tell me the path. 
had he never told me that experience, I might say, eh, you're just giving me hard work to do, but why? See? So number three, it guides people towards unpoisoned medicine. So I told you that, that bad theology can lead to dangerous results. Well, theology is a medicine. If it is related to worship, we need to understand that we want to dive into the pure medicine, the pure mysteries of God. And so one priest I know, he said this so beautifully. He said, while, while good theology and, and good doctrine indeed does set up boundaries, we want to be careful of that image because we don't want to seem like it, it's making us too constrained. Theology doesn't constrain us. It actually makes us explode into the, I mean, the true persons we are. It, it brings us true freedom. So he said, while it's true that, th that good theology and doctrine are like signposts keeping the, on the straight and narrow, they're also like platforms on the proper ocean of God's mercy, off of which we dive into that ocean to experience it. So good doctrine, expressed in theology, also helps reveal to us this great mystery and helps us gu guide us to the right mystery. It doesn't just keep us off the wrong path, in other words, but it keeps us on the right path. Okay? So those are the three reasons that, that, that theology, mainly the three reasons why theology is important. Even if it's impossible, we do the best we can with it. So we see this take place in the church in the church's history, with especially with the ecumenical synods, the holy and ecumenical synods. These were the, the councils that gathered together a, a large majority of bishops of the church and talked about what the church actually believes. Now, there's a big mistake that historians make when they look at these ecumenical synods. What they often say is that these ecumenical synods decided what the church actually believed. And we see this happen again and again and again. A lot of people say that Constantine, the, the Emperor Constantine, who we have up on the wall, that he invented Christianity when he called the first ecumenical synod. He invented modern Christianity because that council uh, uh, rejected Arianism and said that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully human. Uh, or really the council focused on the, on the divine aspect, that he's fully God. So did that council decide what the church believed? No. What, what the council did was say, this is how the church has always worshipped. And because someone has now said something that goes against the way we've always worshipped, we now have to put into words what we really believe so that this false belief doesn't poison people's worship and lead them away from God. So the council doesn't decide what the church believes. It simply puts into word what the church has always believed, but not expressed, because we guard that mystery. And we know that the words are never going to be sufficient. It's, you, can, you can kind of see these councils happening reluctantly. You know, it's these, these holy figures kind of throw up their hands and say, oh, now we have to put into writing what we believe. We've always known this in our hearts, but now we have to put it into writing in order to protect people against this false and dangerous belief. What this means is that the ecumenical synods were not just a gathering of bishops. It was a gathering of holy bishops. It was a gathering of bishops who had to one degree or another, experienced this in their own lives, experienced the reality of God. Some of them to a great degree, St. Nicholas of Myron Lacy, the Wonder Worker, is a great example of this, and some to a lesser degree. But of the seven, and I would argue there's really nine, that's a whole other discussion, we'll get to that in a few lectures, but of at least the seven ecumenical synods, almost every single attendee, besides the, ones who are, the figures who are condemned, almost every single bishop is commemorated as a saint. When we commemorate the first ecumenical synod, we commemorate the 318 fathers of the Holy first Holy Ecumenical Synod. Besides a few examples, a few exceptions, almost every single bishop who attended is a saint of the church. You can imagine, I mean, just how glorious it was to be at one of these councils. So, theology of experience, as we said, is the highest, but not all are fit to theologize in words. Not all are fit for that. It's really those who have experienced it and, and this is where secular education becomes very useful. A lot of the greatest theologians of the church were very educated. Again, some were not. Many of the apostles were not. Most of them were not. St. Anthony was not. And yet, St. Anthony didn't say, I'm going to be the one to go out into the cities and fight against Arianism. St. Athanasius was the right person for that. Because not only did he have experience, but he also had the secular education to give him the language to be able to fight the Arians. A lot of people at that time, unfortunately it's not so much today, but at that time people respected a strong intellect, and so they wanted people who could use the 
philosophical terms of the age and explain things in a logical manner. So you look at some of these great fathers like St. Gregory of Nazianzus the theologian, St. Gregory of Nyssa, St. Basil of the Great, St. John Chrysostom. They were highly educated, but what they understood was that this education was meant to be used as a tool to help express the inexpressible. That philosophy itself doesn't become the point. This is what happened with a lot of the heretics, where they took the, the logic and the pagan education they'd been given, and they used that as theology itself. The father said, no, the experience is where the theology comes from. The logic and pagan philosophy is going to help me to express it in ways that will be understandable to you. And the church, by the way, has, a, has this, uh, this kind of dual view on the, uh, the ancient pagan philosophers. Sometimes you see them completely maligned by the fathers of the church. But you have to understand that when they do this, they're not really maligning the philosophers themselves. What they're trying to do is take people who are obsessed with this pagan philosophy and won't move beyond it and, and show how Christianity is so much greater, how the revealed faith of Christianity is greater. Most of the fathers, they say, no, this is actually a useful, necessary tool. St. Greg of Nyssa, he calls it a stepping stone. He says we begin with, with this type of, of philosophizing, but then we go to experiential theology. In, in other words, we start with this logic, and then through prayer we get to a higher plane, and then we can use that philosophy to describe what we experienced. He talked about this in, in his Life of Moses. And this is why you can find in some ancient churches on Mount Athos, in the narthex, they won't put in the nave, but in the narthex, the entry of the church, sometimes you'll find frescoes in iconographic form, but without the halo of the ancient philosophers. You can find Plato and Socrates and Aristotle and others, because the, the church recognizes that th just as we step into the nave through the narthex, so that philosophy can help us step into true theology. This is the best view that the, that the uh, fathers give on, on the uh, philosophers. These are useful things. The, in times, they're really necessary for us. However, we don't stop with, with uh, speculative theology and philosophy. We have to go into the experience. Um, th this is a, um, one of the things that describes the, the, the big difference between knowing about something and knowing something directly. Okay, So one of the examples I like to give of this is imagine if you had an opportunity to choose between one of two things. You want to know about George Washington, and you have the opportunity to either read three of his greatest, three of the greatest biographies of him, or to go back in time and spend three hours with him. Which one are you going to do? Obviously, most people would say, I'd rather just go spend three hours with him. I can ask him anything I want. Now, in three hours, are you going to get as much information about him necessarily? No, but knowing him is a very different thing than knowing about him. And we want to know people. So with Christ, we don't want to just know about Christ. Again, that's, that's useful and beneficial to us, and it's necessary to know about Christ. However, what we want more than anything is to know Christ intimately. This is what we really want, and this is the difference between theology through prayer and theology simply through study. Again, both can be useful, but theology through prayer is the most significant and the highest. Um, I don't know if I talk about this later, but I may just skip and talk about it now. Uh, I don't know if you know this about uh, Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas, who wrote the Summa in, in, in the West, so we considered one of the great doctors of, of Roman Catholic theology. Uh, Thomas Aquinas is that figure who looked at the mystery of God and decided to write down every single detail, and he literally did that. I mean, he wrote down every question he could think about, about God. But then, then one day, he had a vision in which Christ appeared to him. And you know what he said about his writings after that? He said basically that his writings were worthless and all they were fit for was straw for the fire. Now, I didn't know this last part of this. I was told this by a parishioner uh, this past year. Thomas Aquinas spent the next... I thought that happened at the very end of his life. No, he continued to live on. You know what he spent the rest of his life doing besides praying? He sought to collect all of his writings that had become so popular and destroy them. It didn't work. <laughs> Obviously, it didn't work. But he realized that that direct experience of, of Christ was so much higher than anything he wrote. He thought this could be dangerous if people focus too much on this intellectualization of theology. Theology is done primarily not through the head, but through the heart. And after it's done in the heart, we use the head to express it. Again, in imperfect language, but it's still necessary.
Now, in saying this once, I had somebody complain to me that I was presenting orthodoxy as being somehow unintellectual. And my response was, no, not, not at all. Well, again, some of our greatest saints were very intellectual, very well educated. Many of my favorite saints had many you know, different degrees and some modern ones. St. Justin Popovich, who posed in 1979, is one of my favorite saints. Very, very brilliant, multiple degrees. But again, it was, his, it was theology done by experience that really led what he was doing. He was a monk first and foremost, and then a, an academic theologian. Even St. Nectarios, people would be surprised when they went into his office and they saw all the books from the most famous and, and popular atheists of the time. They saw his, th th their books on his shelves and they go, why are you reading this junk? And he would say, because we have to know how to respond. We have to know how to respond. At the same time, a nun walked in on St. Nectarius once when he was, in he was in prayer and she saw him floating above the ground. So he had both. <laughs> so there is a place for both. We're certainly not unintellectual. However, we recognize that that intellectual nature of theology isn't really for everybody. I mean, after all, didn't Christ say that he didn't come to give the faith to the wise of the world? He came to give it to children. So we need to be as children in a heart first, humble. And for those who are in the place and called by God to do it, they become the academic theologians who will defend the faith on an academic and, and, and uh, philosophical plane. There is a place for that. We're not against that whatsoever. But we recognize that the direct experience of God is the most important. So what of the negative when it comes to philosophy? Well, a couple things. Number one, it's dangerous to rely on philosophy alone. We're fallen. Our logic is imperfect. We easily draw false con con conclusions. If our logic were perfect, just like all of man fell at the, in, from paradise, so logic fell too. We have fallen logic. If logic were perfect, we wouldn't have hundreds or thousands of denominations because through logic, we would all come to the same conclusions about who God is and who the church is, and we'd all be united. But logic has fallen. Do you notice that with time, philosophy hasn't become more united, it's become more fragmented? Logic is imperfect, and we do it from an imperfect place. And second, as I, as I said before, I need to keep emphasizing, words and concepts are created. And because they're created, they're inadequate to describe an uncreated God. This is why logic and philosophy can't take us all the way. It also is a problem that, again, they're tools of the mind and the throne of God within us. When Christ says the kingdom of heaven is within you, the fathers all universally say that's within the heart. The heart is the spiritual center of man. So this takes us back to speaking about God. Because theology is described in human and finite is describing in human and finite words things that are divine and infinite and thus impossible, orthodox theology tends towards one type of theology, a safer type, over the other. And the two types of theologies, there's no test in this, you don't have to memorize these phrases, but again, today I told you it's going to be a little bit more difficult. The two words are apophatic and cataphatic. There's apophatic theology and cataphatic theology. So Apophatic theology. This is what where orthodoxy tends more to, to use this rather than cataphatic theology. Apophatic theology says it's safer to say what God is not than what God is. Okay, so right at the beginning of the consecration of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ in the liturgy, this is what we call the anaphora. Right before that, and so right after the creed, there's a, a prayer that's uh, recited by the priest. It's usually done silently, so you, you rarely hear it. Um, if you come on Tuesday mornings, uh, sometimes um, Andrew will stop the chanting so I can do this one out loud, um, but it doesn't happen very often. But part of that prayer goes like this. It is meet and right to him thee, to bless thee, to praise thee, to give thanks unto thee, and to worship thee in every place of thy dominion. For thou art God ineffable, inconceivable, invisible, incomprehensible, ever existing and eternally the same, thou and then only begotten Son and thy Holy Spirit. Now, first thing to notice, do you notice that that prayer begins with worship and then goes to describing God? So this is exactly what we're talking about today. It is meet right to him thee, to bless thee, to praise thee, to give thanks to thee, to worship thee in every place of the union. For thou art God, and now I'm going to describe you, because first we start with worship. Second, though, notice that every single one of the words, or nearly every single one to describe God, are actually negative terms. They're, they say what God is not. God is ineffable. He is inconceivable. He is invisible. He is incomprehensible. 
not comprehensible. This is safer for us because instead of saying directly what God is with words that are never sufficient, we're simply saying, we know that you're not all these other things. This is how we know you're not. You know, you're not a malicious God. <laughs> you're, you're not an angry God throwing us all into hell. You're not visible. You're not conceivable. You're not comprehensible. This is where we, we really focus. This is why scriptures use, um, by the way, imagery so often with God. There's a lot of anthropomorphism in the scriptures with God because what we're doing is we're describing our experience over the reality of God. We're saying this is how man experiences God, which I can describe much more accurately than describing God himself. Okay? So as an example of this, in the scriptures, sometimes it talks about how God becomes angry. Well, now, there's a problem with that, because theologically we'd say, can God, is, is God swayed by emotions? Do his emotions overcome him? Does he become, is the unchanging God one who becomes angry one minute, then happy the next, and then sad the next? Well, no, of course not. God is unchanging. God is unchanging. So when we say that God becomes angry, is that then wrong? Well, no, what we're doing is we're describing our experience of God. So St. Maximus the Confessor and Abba Dorotheos and others, they use this one of these images. It's one of my favorites. And they say that if you take two elements, wax and clay, and bring them both into the midday sun and the heat of it, what's going to happen? The wax will soften, but the clay will harden and crack. It's the same exact sun. It's the same exact rays of light. It's the same exact heat. And yet they react very differently. Now, if this is man and God, those with hearts like wax soften before God. Those with, with hearts like clay harden before God. This explains Pharaoh. Have you ever thought about that with, with Moses and it says that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh? And you read it and you think, is God making Pharaoh more sinful? Is he, is he doing... No, it's not that. It's that the, the more the light of God shines upon Pharaoh, his heart is like clay. And so it becomes harder and harder every time he... You notice that his heart becomes hardened every time he experiences a great miracle of God? He sees a miracle and then he's hardened? Yeah. The, the experience of God makes his heart harder and harder because he's chosen to have a heart that's more like clay than like wax. So it's not that God changes his way towards us, it's that the way we experience God changes based on our own intentions and the purity of our own hearts. So again, purity of heart, our love and humility affect the way we perceive God and how he acts towards us. But poor perceptions, bad theology, means that our heart is kept from being purified rightly. This is why we, we are so focused on, on preaching and learning true theology. We should also know that that, that, uh, that process, by the way, of purifying your heart, it's a slow process. It's a slow and difficult process. One of the things I meant to describe last week, I'll describe it today, is that a lot of people, when they become orthodox, they, they don't realize that they're still holding on to a lot of preconceived notions about who God is, who man is, and what their relationship is, that are based in the heterodox theology, in Protestant and Catholic theology, or some of its LDS theology. And these things don't really fit with orthodoxy. And so what happens is, is the reason this takes so long, you may have a framework and all these pieces and ideas that fit within it. And every now and then, you learn something about God by reading the saints, their lives, their writings, or just in the worship of the church, and you go, oh, this piece no longer fits. And you take the piece out and you put the new piece in. And you keep doing this over and over and over again until you realize, oh my goodness, I have all these new pieces in here, but the framework doesn't work anymore. And that's when the whole thing crumbles, which can be a painful process, but then you start rebuilding from the bottom up. That doesn't happen immediately. It happens over the course of years. That's why uh, St. Sophroni of Essex says that once somebody becomes orthodox, it takes about 20 years to really become orthodox. When I first read that, I was like, oof, oh my goodness, 20 years. And then, I, then I went, wait a minute, how long have I been orthodox? Oh, 21 years. And yeah, last year is the first year where I feel like it really finally settled. He's right. But that doesn't mean those 20 years are wasted, so don't, don't be downcast by that. Those 20 years, God is working. But it takes a long time. It takes a long time to reform the heart. Okay, let's get back to apophatic and cataphatic theology. And how am I doing? Terribly. Okay, we're going to speed up with the hardest stuff. <laughs> so, even though we focus on apophatic theology primarily, we need some cataphatic theology. You can't get rid of it completely. We need to say some positive things about God, some things that are true. And the scriptures, of course, the, the main one that comes to mind for most people is, what, it, what is God? God is love. God is love. That, that's a cataphatic statement that we make about God. But because human understanding comes into play, 
and human understanding falls far short of what God and who God truly is. When we say something positive about God, the Orthodox are very cautious to then negate exactly what we just said is true. <laughs> and I know that this is where people get really confused, so I'm going to try to go slow as I try to speed up. Makes total sense. So this talk will be like theology. It's impossible. Okay. This, I, admittedly, this is a really unusual way from how we typically think, but what we do is we say something about God is true, and then we make the comment about that statement. And, we, and what we do is we suggest that that statement about God is not true because the words we used are inadequate to describe the reality. So as an example, I could say God is just. Is God just? Yes, God is just. However, God's justice does not align with any human conception of justice whatsoever. In fact, in many ways, we could say God is not just. If he were just, we're all in big trouble. His mercy overcomes his justice, but there's still an aspect of God that's just. But his justice, again, is a, is a concept that we can't possibly understand because we're going to take a human understanding of justice and apply it to God. And so, after saying that God is just, we immediately have to say, but God is not really just in the way that we understand it. I say it, and then I negate it because I have to negate the comment I just made. If, if we applied a fully human concept of justice to God, we would actually dishonor God. And we dishonor his justice because his justice is so much more glorious and awesome than our understanding. So even though we're using the same word just or justice, we simply can't comprehend what God's justice is really like. And so while I can say, yes, God is just, I also have to say, but God is not just because our understanding of justice doesn't even come close to God's justice. We could say the same thing with his mercy, his power, his love, anything. God is merciful. True, yes. But God is not merciful in the way I understand mercy. There's no way he's, 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 he's merciful in the way I understand mercy because my understanding of mercy is broken and his is perfect. So God is merciful. He's also not merciful. Some fathers go so far as to say we could say God exists, but we also can't say God exists because everything that we have in mind when we say exists is something created. God is uncreated. So he exists on a plane that is way beyond anything we can understand. So are, are you with me on this? I, this is like a tough con. Are you with me? Admit if you're not. Be humble. <laughs> there was like a sort of. Okay, that was honest. <laughs> it was like, it was like eh, sort of. Okay, you understand at least the concept, you know, even if we don't fully, uh, uh, we don't, don't understand in the depths. But let's return back to St. Paul because hopefully you're going to understand that quote even better now. So it's the same quote I'm going to give you now in context. 2 Corinthians uh, 12, 2 to 4. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Again, take it back to what we're talking about with apophatic and cataphatic theology. Any description of this experience will necessarily cheapen, soil, and distort the reality. And so St. Paul says, yes, I know a man, really himself, I had this experience, and yet I can't really talk about this experience. Because as soon as I tell you something true about it, I tell you that's not really true because the words don't suffice. And in, 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 if it soils the experience, if it, if it distorts it, then I'm dishonoring God. And we have to be careful about that. Okay. Was there a question? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4. Okay, so with that, I told you we're going to talk about the nature of God, so let's talk about God. Now, there we go. I was going to say, if you understood everything I've talked about, somewhat, you should laugh when I say that. I just told you it's impossible, and now we're going to do it. <laughs> so it is necessary. So because it's necessary, we have to begin even with imperfect knowledge. So I'm glad someone laughed. It means you're paying attention. <laughs> um, Back when I was in high school, I took a biology class and we talked about genes and how genes are passed down and how an intermix of different types of genes when someone creates offspring, you know, animals or even people. Um, and we talked about what could result from the, that intermix of genes. But as soon as we were done with a lesson, our, our instructor said, but I want you to know that everything I just told you is not actually accurate. And we're like, oh, thanks. Like, how does that help? And she said, you have to understand that I'm giving you a framework that gives you some principles that are true. 
But the reality is so much more complex than I gave you that we would say that what I just gave you is not actually reality. However, it's still necessary to start there. And I, I thought that's, that's actually a great way to talk about theology. You know, what, what great theologians experience and then use philosophical terms to describe are things that they're going to describe to us, but the experience is going to be so much greater that words will fall silent. But we still need those words for now because they'll help us get to that experience. So, two terms to start off with. When we talk about God, we talk about usia, O-U-S-I-A, and hypostasis, H-Y-P-O-S-T-A-S-I-S. Usia and hypostasis. Usia, we typically translate as essence. Sometimes it's translated as nature, but that can be really problematic, so I prefer the term essence. Essence, we define as that without which something is no longer what it is. I know, it's clear as mud, right? That without which something is no longer what it is. Okay, so think of a chair. If we, if we have a chair, would wood be the essence of the chair? No, because you're sitting in chairs right now that are not made of wood. They're still chairs. So something could be without wood and still be a chair. What we would talk about is probably its use, the fact that it's something that's intended to be sat upon and made to hold somebody up when they sit, you know, I, I, I don't know, I, I've never really thought about it too much, but we would have to go into this, this philosophical description of what makes something a chair and not a chair. Now, we, we couldn't just say that it holds a person up because you can sit in an ottoman and it's not a chair or sit on a bed and it's not a chair. So there's something else to it that, that's, that's meant. And, and I think probably we could say that a chair is meant for one person. Um, you know, we could go through some other things that make it the essence. So the essence is those things which make a thing what it is, without which it's no longer what it is. Okay, hypostasis is most often translated as person. Okay, um, so a person or hypostasis is the individual expression of an essence. Okay, so you are sitting on an individual example of a chair. Um, now, in in Platonic terms, we don't need to get into this, but Platonic Plato would say that the essence is in this world of ideas. And so a chair has chairness. Chairness is the essence, and that particular chair is the hypostatic realization of it. Again, you don't need to get too deep into this, but I want you to have some basic understanding. So one of the ways we could describe this is think of paintings. I could give you three different paintings. Each one is made of canvas and some, some paint and colors, and there's form, but they're three different expressions even though they use the same elements. So the essence is the canvas and the paint and the form, but the hypostasis is the individual example of those paintings, okay? We could say thing, the same thing with people. We have a common essence, body and soul and, and, and noose or spirit, but we're, we're not all the same person. We don't share the same, the, the same uh, expression. We have a different hypostasis, okay? So when we talk about God, we say that God is one and three at the same time. That one is his essence. There is one God. There's one essence. But there's three hypostases. And those hypostases are Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, the fathers, I said, use a lot of analogies because there's really no perfect way. And even the, the analogies fall short. But one of the ones that are commonly used is um, that the Father is the Son, not the Son, S-O-N, but S-U-N, like the, the, sun, the star, the Father is the Son, the, the Son of God is the light, and the Holy Spirit is the warmth. That was one of the examples you might find. Sometimes they say the ray, these can change. Um, at the first Holy and Ecumenical Synod, St. Spiridon was there, and St. Spiridon was talking to Arius, and Arius was saying, you know, how can you, how can you describe this Trinity to me? Like, this is, this is foolishness. And he held up a brick, and he said, just as a brick is made of fire, water, and sand, so God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as he said that, fire came from the top of the brick and water came from the bottom. You can see this in iconography. This is one of the great miracles that happened at the First Ecumenical Synod. So, uh, St. Spiridon. St. Spiridon is, is one of the uh, uh, great bishops of the, that First Ecumenical Synod, a great wonder worker. Uh, his relics continue to work wonders to this day. Now, as I said, none of these analogies is perfect, and none can be, because we're using created images to describe something that's uncreated. It doesn't really work. But they're still useful in at least giving some principles of what we're talking about. So, as I said, with, with uncreated versus created, all things we think about 
or relate things to are created. E even ideas and concepts. We have literally nothing. There's nothing you can think of or understand that is not related to um, to uncreated. That's not related to created things. Everything has a created nature, and that's why when thinking of, about the what of God, it's so difficult. Who is God? What is God? Well, what's the essence of God? What's the thing without which He's no longer God? His uncreatedness. God being uncreated. This is the this is the main essence of God. V beyond this, very little can be said about His essence. Because it's uncreated, because it has the nature of being uncreated, we really can't describe the essence of God. Again, no, no, there's no idea you can have. Even ideas are created. And so there's nothing we can, we can relate God to that isn't created. And so we always run into this is issue. And by the way, this is an issue we run into. It's not really an issue, but it's just the reality of it. This reality, we believe, is for all eternity. We will never know the essence of God. Because no matter what, there's a divide between the created and the uncreated. Now, there's a way around that in how we experience God, but we'll talk about that in a future lecture, okay? That's not for today. The essence of God is unknowable to man. And so that essence of being uncreated is shared by the entire Trinity, for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're all uncreated. None of them was created, okay? Now, when we use created items, like the sun and light analogy or the brick, we have to use those in limited ways because they can get us into trouble. So an example of this is we don't want to then, what, we, what we're trying to do is, is use these as analogies to describe God, but you can't base God in those examples. And what I mean by that is this. Um, you could say, okay, we know that anybody who's a son has a mother and a father, and Jesus is called the son of God the Father, and therefore he must also have a mother. That's where doing things backwards can get you into big trouble. By the way, that's what Muslims do. <laughs> they, 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 they say, oh, how can you believe in this trinity? You know, every, every child has a, has a father and a mother, so who's, who's the mother of God? And we would say, no, you're trying to take created things and apply it to the uncreated God. That's not possible. That's not possible. So you cannot use these created concepts and apply them to an uncreated God in a universal way. But we can find some principles that say, okay, we can, we can describe a certain idea about God using these created things while understanding that they're very limited. They're very limited in what they can do. So, the Trinity shares a common essence, mainly of being uncreated. And th those are the, the um, that, that's what is shared by the entirety of the Trinity. Okay? What makes each member, each person, or hypostasis of the Trinity distinct is what we'll talk about next. What makes them different, their personhood, is found in particular attributes. And these attributes are particular to each person or hypostasis, which means they're not shared by the other two. If there's a hypostatic principle in one member of the Trinity, it will not be shared in the other two. Okay, so what, what are we talking about here? Well, what's the hypostatic principle of the Father? What makes the Father uh, uh, unique from the Son and the Holy Spirit? When we say the word God, by the way, in many writings, even in the scriptures sometimes, we typically mean the Father as the Godhead. So the, the Father is the Godhead, the one from whom the Son and the Holy Spirit have their being. So this attribute of being the Godhead is unique to the Father, and it is not shared by the Son or the Holy Spirit. Neither the Son is, is the Godhead, nor the Holy Spirit is the Godhead. Only the Father is the Godhead. Okay? What about the Son? The Son is begotten of the Father. He is begotten outside of time. Not, not, not at the beginning of time, outside of time. There was no time. We can't understand what that's like. Because time is created. So we can't understand what it's like to be outside of time completely. But he was begotten outside of time. So his begottenness has no beginning. He is eternal, just as the Father is eternal. He is begotten, but not created. And the Son became incarnate. He became man. Only the Son is begotten of the Father. The Holy Spirit is not begotten of the Father, and the Father is not begotten of anyone. Only the Son became incarnate. Neither the Father nor the Holy Spirit became incarnate. Okay? Hopefully I said that all right. When I did my talks on Roman Catholicism, I talked about the filioque. I said a bunch of things wrong, and then I had to go and annotate it. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Holy Trinity. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. This, again, is outside of time. There was never a time 
when the Spirit was not in existence, just like the Son. There was never a time when the Spirit did not proceed from the Father. For all eternity, before time, the Holy Spirit has proceeded from the Father. And the Holy Spirit descended on Pentecost to illumine the disciples. Neither the Father nor the Son descended in tongues of fire. Neither the Father nor the Son proceed. Only the Holy Spirit proceeds. It is unique to one. Do, do you, do you, oh, maybe I'm going to talk about this. Am I going to talk about this? Well, let me say this first. Many wonder what the difference is between being begotten of the Father as the Son is and proceeding from the Father as the Spirit is, proceeds from the Father. But you know what the, you know what the, uh, the Father say about this? They say the verbiage of being begotten or proceeding was revealed by, by Jesus Christ. And going beyond what he gave us, trying to understand the difference between being begotten and proceeding, these are things that have not been given to us. And therefore, the proper way to deal with that is to remain silent and in awe of this mystery. They say it's dangerous to delve into things that are not necessary. Don't delve into it. It's, it would be arrogantly foolish and even dangerous to inquire into the nature of the Trinity beyond what was made available and revealed to us. So don't try. <laughs> so all we know is that the, whole, the Son is begotten of the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. We just leave it at that. By the way, this is what I was going to mention a second ago. Do, do, are, you, are you starting to see why we have an issue with the, uh, with the filioque? The idea that, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son? Well, now, an aspect of the Father being the Godhead is now shared by the Son. So the Father becomes a Godhead from which the Holy Spirit proceeds. The Son becomes a Godhead from which the Holy Spirit proceeds. The Holy Spirit is not a Godhead. So it actually knocks the Holy Spirit down and makes him somehow lesser than the Father and the Son, and it ruins the balance of the Trinity. From that flow many other theological issues, which is what Tertullian talks about, how heresy begets more heresy. So this is why, why we took, you may say, oh, is it that big of, I had somebody said, say this, this to me once a couple of years ago here. He's a Roman Catholic, um, but he was, he was visiting our church, and he said, do you, think, do, you think the feel of, do you think that really matters? And I said, yes, <laughs> yes. A, because it's not revealed theology. So we don't, we don't take what was not revealed and then speculate and then affirm it as true. But B, it actually throws the whole Trinity out of balance. So this is a very serious thing. So I, I mentioned that one of the, the aspects of the Holy Spirit is that only the Holy Spirit descended on Pentecost and only the Son became incarnate and only the Father is the Godhead. But there's this kind of like strange mystery in the Trinity that because they share one essence, an experience of one hypostasis of the Trinity is an experience of all three. In other words, you're not going to experience the Son without somehow the presence of the Father and the Spirit. You won't experience the Spirit without somehow the presence of the Father and the, and the Son. And we know this, again, this is all scriptural. We know this from the scriptures, okay? In, in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 14, we read, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we shall be satisfied. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. The Father didn't become incarnate, but by experiencing Christ, you experience the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Again, that's John 14, it's verses 8 through 11. So this is all based in the scriptures. We're going to cover all this again and in more depth when we get to lecture four, okay? Uh, when we talk uh, more about the Trinity. But I really want you to have a foundational um, uh, uh, knowledge of these, these four concepts. We just covered four main concepts, okay? So the first concept was apophatic versus cataphatic theology, okay? So apophatic theology saying what God is not and cataphatic theology saying what God is. Both are necessary. They have to go hand in hand, but we, we tend to rely more on apophatic theology because it's safer. It's safer to say what God is not, because I can rely and say, God is not visible, and I can, I can rest pretty safe in that. But once I say something that, that, uh, positive about God, what po God positively is, I then have to say, but not in the way that we understand it. So I have to negate it. We understand that so far? S somewhat? <laughs> okay. Number two, uh, the concept of usia, essence. The idea that this is the thing without which it's no longer the, what we're calling it. So God, the main essence that we can talk about is he is uncreated. He was not created by anyone. He's been in existence for all eternity before all time existed. God is uncreated, and this is shared by the three persons, or hypostasis of the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
Number three is hypostasis, or personhood. These are the attributes that are unique to each member of the Holy Trinity. The Father is unbegotten. The Son, uh, woo boy, almost said heresy. The Son is begotten of the Father and became incarnate. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and descended on Pentecost. Okay, and those, those are, that's number four, those unique attributes. Okay, do we understand that? At least, uh, do we feel somewhat comfortable with, with uh, everything I said? Okay. Okay, um, another thing. Uh, do we understand when I say that theology is impossible but essential? Do we understand? That's, that's pretty important to understand. See, human created language will never describe an uncreated God, and yet we need to do the best we can for those reasons we talked about. It keeps us away from falling into a bad path, it keeps us on the right path, and it keeps us diving into the true mystery of God with an unpolluted, unpoisoned water. you understand that? Okay. Um, this, this helps explain when you read some of the books that are on the book list. I'm not going to go into this right now, uh, but it helps explain why some of the modern theologians, especially somebody like uh, Father Harothus Vlachos, I have the book, um, The Illness and Cure of the Soul in the Orthodox Tradition, on that book list. Wonderful book. And he describes in some of his writings, I forget if it's in that book or not, but he describes that the fall of the West happened because they stopped doing the theology of the heart and they started doing speculative theology. And that this is really where the danger came from. This started a lot with, with St. Augustine. St. Augustine is a saint for us, but he never left his philosophical rootings. And so he tried to apply Christianity and fit them into this, that framework that we talked about. And he never really changed that framework. Okay, And this is why he gets some, some areas pretty wrong. There's another book. Um, I can't think of the name of it. I think it's called Acquiring the Mind of the Orthodox Church by um, Father Sergius Boyer, Bowyer, B-O-W-Y-E-R. Um, it's, it's a short book. It's nice. It's on Audible. Um, and he talks a lot about uh, St. Augustine and where he gets some of this theology off. So if you're interested in that topic, you can look there. But essentially, um, and again, he's still a saint of the church for us. We see him more as a saint of piety than a saint of theology. We're cautious with this theology. But St. Augustine is actually the reason I started down the road that eventually led me to become a priest. I didn't know it at the time, but I read his confessions and my life was changed. I love St. Augustine, so I don't want to hammer on him. However, the West took some of the speculative theology and some of the mistakes he made and stopped doing theology of the heart so much. And so they lost what we call hesychism. Uh, we can talk about that in another lecture. But they lost this, this sense of this deepness of prayer, and they started doing a lot of theology through philosophy, through logic, and through the mind. And this is where you get that scholastic theory of Thomas Aquinas. I already told you, Thomas Aquinas realized the mistake, but the rest of the West didn't. As he was trying to get rid of his own books, people were still copying them and, and reading them. And a lot of the theology was based in this. So when the West started to fall away, when they embraced the filioque, when they embraced the wrong things about the Pope, when they embraced purgatory, it's because they were coming to logical conclusions based in fallen logic rather than in the revealed truth about God. I've listened to many, um, I listen to a lot of Roman Catholic radio, and every now and then somebody will call into the call in show and the answer given, I'll just, I, like, like, it's a good thing that I haven't veered the car off the road in <laughs> like exasperation because some of the answers given, just, it, it, it's almost painful. I go, yeah, I can see why there's, a, there's, a, there's like a, a perfect ordered logic to this, but you can't fit God in this box, which is why I'm always going back to relationship, which is why this is, by the way, a more beautiful, but also a harder path. Relationship is much more difficult. You can't just have pat answers in a lot of these things. God works in mysterious ways, but that's a good thing because we want to delve into the mystery rather than contain God within our minds. So the intellect was used in the West to speculate about God rather than to put an experience into words. This is the theology of, of uh, or the state of theology today very much. Much of theology today is written with speculative theology and with philosophy and logic and not through experience. And that's why we're, we're extremely cautious about these things. When we try to understand something like the scriptures, 2,000 years Christians have been trying to understand the scriptures. We're more fragmented rather than less. Like we talked about philosophy, the same thing is happening. Experience is necessary. And why? Because if the Holy Spirit filled the authors of the New Testament, then those who are filled with the exact same spirit are the ones who are best suited to interpret the scriptures. The Holy Spirit helps inspire the writing, and then the Holy Spirit helps inspire the interpretation. 
This happened in the life of St. John Chrysostom. St. John Chrysostom, they have his, a part of his relics on Mount Athos, and they have a skull. And on his skull, they have an opening on the, on the case that they have a skull in, and there's an opening on the right ear. And his right ear has not decomposed. It's incorrupt. You can look at this, by the way, online. You can look it up in Google and you'll find it. There's pictures of it. How? Why? Well, what happened with... Okay, so St. John Chrysostom, if you don't know, he was not only the greatest preacher, but he also the greatest expositor of the scriptures, and especially of the epistles of St. Paul. Loved St. Paul. Absolutely loved St. Paul. Talked about him quite a bit. Has a whole such series of homilies just in praise of St. Paul and on his greatness. St. John Chrysostom would give these homilies that would go on for you know, 40, 45 minutes. People would be upset when they were done because he spoke so beautifully. Um, I'll tell you, as someone who doesn't understand Greek, when I would read him in the original Greek when I was in seminary, there was like this flowing poetic nature of the words that even if I didn't understand them, I went, whoa, there's something so beautiful. Like everything about it was poetic and his theology was so solid. So one, one day someone came to see him and they talked to his um, kind of like he had like a, an attendant, you know, like a secretary. It was Proclus, who was actually St. Proclus. St. Proclus said, oh, I'll, I'll go check and, and see if he's ready to meet with you. And he peeks into his office and he, what does he see? He sees... He sees St. John Chrysostom writing uh, one of his homilies, and he sees somebody talking in his ear, just whispering in his ear. So he goes, oh, I'll come back later. Come back later, the same thing. He tells the guy, sorry, wait a little bit longer. He comes back, and the guy's gone. And he, he, he tells St. John, he said, oh, uh, I have somebody here to meet with you. He's been here, he's been waiting quite some time. And he goes, why didn't you send him in? He goes, well, you were here with somebody. So I wasn't here with anybody. What are you talking about? He goes, yeah, there's, there was somebody here, and, 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 and he was whispering into your ear as you were writing. So you be writing down every word that he was saying. And St. John's just like, I don't know what you're talking about. So he goes, tell me what this guy looked like. He starts describing him. And St. John, it just dawns on him. And he pulls out on the side of him. He had a, he had a, a hand-painted icon of St. Paul. And he goes, do you look like this? And Proclus goes, that's the guy. That's the guy. And so you can find this really beautiful icon. It's one of my favorite icons of St. Paul whispering in the right ear, which today is still incorrupt, the right ear of St. John Chrysostom, and he's writing one of his commentaries on one of the epistles of St. Paul. And the page on which he's writing begins as a page, but as it goes up, it turns into water, and the water flows into a river, and then there's a bunch of faithful going and taking cups and drinking from the river of, of his words. So it's one of my favorite icons. I love it. This is the best. This is the truest theology. This is what, what we want in, in, the, in the interpretation of scriptures. Those whom the saints have spoken to, whether visibly or invisibly, those who have had the same experiences as the ones who wrote the scriptures in the first place. This means, by the way, the ascetic life is absolutely essential. There is no true theology, experiential theology, without the ascetic life. Now, can you find good academic theologians? Yes. They're the ones who rely on the words of the fathers of the church. So one of my favorite theologians of today is Jean-Claude Larcher. He's a French physician, he's not a clergyman, he's a layman. He wrote some beautiful works and I've actually emailed with him. And I, when I emailed with him, I thanked him for his books. And I said, your books have really like, had a profound effect on me and they, they're so helpful. And he said, he said, I'm so glad the books have helped you, but don't thank me. He said, if you thank anyone, you should thank the Holy Fathers because everything I wrote came directly from them. I have no original ideas of my own, Everything good I write comes from them, so thank the Holy Fathers. That's a good theologian. By the way, he's someone who I think is probably living a holy life, so I don't want to de deny that of him, but he, he would be considered an academic theologian who has written some incredible works because he relies on those who have had the experience. Okay, last thing I'll mention today before we get to questions. Um, I want to just give a word about theology and the internet. Um, this is another area where if you started laughing, I wouldn't blame you because the internet is not a good place to find good theology. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that. Um, there are some places where you can find great articles. And you can find even you know entire books written uh, that, that have been scanned on the internet. You can find good things, but it's intermixed with a lot of junk. And you can go to uh, blogs or uh, discussion groups or social media groups that talk theology all the time and find a bunch of garbage. And a lot of times, again, it's intermixed with some really good stuff. We don't have the discernment to know what's good and what's not, and so my advice is stay away from those things. Because what happens on the internet? Who can write on the internet? Anybody. And so what happens is people who think 
that they have some, somehow the spiritual acumen or the academic acumen to write theology, and they get on and they, they, they take the role of teacher, and no one's put them in that position. And some of the people who are the most aggressive about it and the loudest about it, I guarantee, I guarantee what we talked about last week, forgive me, this is very judgmental, but they're not living out their repentance first and foremost. Repentance is not the central uh, essence of their theology. And how do I know that? Because they spend a lot of time bashing everybody who disagree, disagrees with them. It's ridiculous. Stay away from that junk. Just stay away from it. If you want a really good discussion about this, one of the books, again, on the Catechism book list, everyone should read this. You can also find it on Audible, is Dr. Constantinou, Evgenia Constantinou, or Eugenia Constantinou, wrote a book called Thinking Orthodox, Understanding and Acquiring the Orthodox Mind. And she gets into a lot of these issues about who is a true theologian, um, and she talks a lot about internet theologians and, and how to be very cautious about them. So you need to be extremely cautious about searching for answers on the internet. If you have a theological question, write it down and come talk to me. And I promise you, if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you I don't know the answer. I'm not just going to make it up for you. And if I don't know the answer, I'll probably look it up for you or I'll tell you where you can find it. So I have people who do this and they'll, they'll send me a question. And what I'll do is I'll send them an, a, an article or a, a, a treatise written by a saint. Just read this. You know, because I've spent many years doing this. It's not because I'm a great theologian. I'm not. It's not because I'm something special. I'm not. It's because I've literally spent uh, about 15 years of my life <laughs> almost exclusively reading, like 95% of what I read is Orthodox materials. And I don't have a good memory, which is why I read so much, because it's the only way that anything will ever stick. But if you have some questions, come to me, and if I, I can't answer it, I may send you to someone who can answer it. Um, there are some, some people I know who are really brilliant theologians, um, but we want to be cautious with that. So don't, don't just go looking up on the internet and because it says orthodox, assume that it's correct. There are plenty of things with the label orthodox that I would say are as far from orthodoxy as possible. And in fact, uh, there's a lot of that stuff going around right now. Um, I was watching a couple YouTube videos someone sent me of a, a um, or orthodox uh, academic conference that took place some years ago. And it was all the presenters uh, talking about how important the conference was. And I, I looked at some of their presentations and went, this is like just such absolute junk. It's absolute garbage junk. And there's reasons no one has ever heard of it. Because in orthodoxy, when that happens, we just kind of go, eh, push it to the side and forget it. Um, they've written books that seem very academic and very patristic in the way they're presented. And then you do a little investigation. You go, oh, there's, there's nothing academic or patristic about this. And so you have to be cautious. So please be cautious with those areas. Okay. Um, that leaves us uh, about eight minutes for questions. So if you have any questions, now is the time. Yes. So um, I'm understanding from you the difference between getting and receiving. But then my question is, what is the difference between getting and hating? Because when we think about getting, usually the sort of Yep, and this this is again. So his question was um, th that even if we can't describe the difference between beginning and proceeding, is there a difference between beginning and creating? It's a good question, and the answer is that they're different, <laughs> and we know they're different because we know that uh, Jesus Christ was begotten before all ages and has ever been in existence, and so beginning is not creating. But what is beginning in that sense? It's a coming forth. I mean, even that language is, is dangerous because it can sound like a creation. It sounds like it happens in time. This has happened for all eternity. And so this is one of those areas where silence is the best response. We know that the Son of God was begotten before all creation and that he is not a creation himself. As for saying anything beyond that, I'd rather just remain silent. Because silence is safest. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, this is this is a great question. What what, what when we use the word heart, what exactly are we actually talking about? What do we mean by that? I I can't remember if um I need to look in in when I talk about man. If I talk, I think I mentioned this, but I don't go too much into depth with this. The the fathers of the church talk about how the heart is not only the physical center of man, but is also the spiritual center of man. And it's, um, it's the, the, the place um, in, in which Christ seeks to uh, reveal himself to us. And so in the scriptures, you'll see that the heart has kind of a, a dual uh, nature to it. On the one hand, 
it's the place where all the evil of mankind is. And on the other hand, it's the place where God wants to meet us and all the good of mankind is. So St. Macarius uh, has one of my favorite quotes where he says, uh, with, within man, um, within the heart of man, there's, there's, uh, there's all the wild beasts, all the demons, all the evil, all the passions, but there's also all of angels and all, the, all of heaven and all, of, all the glory of God. Like the heart of man contains everything. Uh, and so what our job is, is to cleanse out the heart and make it a proper receptacle for the spiritual things and a proper throne from God. So our heart is full of both the good and the bad, and this, this spiritual center of man. Um, now, this gets into, um, we could get into more complex things about prayer and the noose and everything. I don't, I don't want to get into that today because we just don't have the time for it, um, and it's in a future lecture. But essentially, this is all you need to know, is that the heart is the spiritual center of man, and it's really intermixed with, with a lot of good and a lot of bad, and so we have to be cautious with it. And so what the, the goal of the spiritual life is, is to purify the heart and make it a suitable throne so that Christ himself will, will sit upon it and make our heart a, a, a place of heaven. And one of the things I always mention when we talk about man is that you know, man can become a little, and I'll mention this in the future lecture, man beca can become a little mobile heaven or a little mobile hell. And so we know this because we've been around people like this. You get around somebody who when they walk into a room, the whole place darkens and feels heavy and feels burdensome and just dark. You know, hell exists within them. Where does it exist? Not within the arms or the legs, but within the heart. Within the heart of man, hell exists there. And then you meet other people who you get into contact with them and suddenly everything becomes light and joyful and beautiful. So, man, heaven could exist within that person. Where does it exist within the heart? So the heart becomes the, the vehicle by which we, we relate to spiritual things. And it's affected by those things. Yes? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so the, the question is, is uh, if asceticism is the way by which we cleanse the heart, is, is this for everybody and how do we do this? And this, is, this will be one of the future lectures. A whole lecture is going to be dedicated to this very topic. I think it's number five. Uh, it could be four. I, I don't have the list in front of me, but um, we'll, we'll, we'll spend an entire lecture talking about where the place of asceticism is. But the simple definition of asceticism, which shows that it's for all Christians, not just for monks and nuns, is when Christ says, if you wish to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. That's asceticism. Asceticism is simply denying ourselves, saying no to, no to the, the sinful egoism that we have within us that's always crying out for me, 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 me. And it's, it's, it's being selfless. Without selflessness, we're incapable of love. I can't love my wife if I'm also being selfish at the same time. Because then my love for her is manipulative. What do I need to do for her to get what I really want out of life? You know, True love is humble. It empties itself out. And the same is true of our love for Christ. So the whole Christian life and the whole Orthodox life is centered on this process of this church as a spiritual hospital is centered on cleansing us of the disease and the cancer of egoism and sin. And what does the church do? It gives us asceticism to cleanse out this, this illness. It gives us spiritual surgeries. But it also gives us the medicines that actually bring us to spiritual health. And again, we'll talk about that in the next, it's really like the next three lectures, if I remember right. Okay. Any last question? Yes. Where do you find the book list? I can send it to you. We'll talk right after this. Okay. And it, it, by the way, it will be online. We're, we're up, we're up, we're, um, we are uh, upgrading the, the, uh, the whole website, and it's just taking me a long time. I don't have a lot of free time to do it, but we will have the whole website uh, revamped within like the next month or so, and the, the book list will be there. But was that what you were going to? I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure. I got like my house. Yeah, there's a, there's a, so it, it comes in the Academy packet that I gave you. I know it's changed in the past year, so I don't know if it's changed uh, since you first got yours. But uh, um, yeah, uh, if you need it, just email me and I'll send it to you. Okay. God bless you all. We'll start in Vespers and see you next week. Maybe it's both of us again. None of them came up.